to say welcome to each and every one this morning. Pray that you've had a good week. Big change from the day to Wednesday, was it? Yes. So, folks, that just goes to show us God's in control. Just goes to show us. Again, like I said, I hope everyone's had a great week. Our devotion this morning is coming out of Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. <clears throat> Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. Our writer this morning's got this entitled, That Blessed Hope. <clears throat> it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Have any prayer requests this morning? Remember my sister, Edith, uh, she has cancer. Uh, with the Lord's help, she'll be better. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Remember Mike Miller, he's got COVID-19. Remember Ernie, uh, he's sick too, but they just think he's got a flu, so you can't never tell. Remember all these. Anyone else this morning? Okay. <laughs> Anyone else this morning? this. <clears throat> Anyone else this morning?
are these. Anyone else this morning before we move on? Folks, I say it, and you probably get tired of hearing me say it. Pray for one another. Amen. You know, prayer means a lot. said y'all probably get tired of hearing me say that every Sunday I'm standing here but I feel like that's what we need to do so uh, anyone else before we move ahead alright if not if you come to your feet we're going to be dismissed to our classes of the Lord of Prayer <clears throat> Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for another day that you've spared us. Father, we thank you for our health and our strength, Lord, and allowing us to come back out to thy house this morning just to refill on your word, your glory. Father, we can't thank you enough for all the blessings you pass our way each and every day. Father, so many of these blessings, Lord, we take for granted. It's just a daily routine. But God, we know it's not. Father, if it wasn't for you, <clears throat> we wouldn't have anything at all. Father, we just thank you for our small church, what it means to us. Lord, the people that make up our church, we thank you for each and every one of them. Father, we just want you to let them know. Father, we love each and every one here. Father, we just pray, Lord, that you would bless Israel. Lord, just bless them this morning. That they would do the right thing, Lord. And all this is up building of your kingdom, Father. Father, we just thank you. For everything that you do for us. Father, we just pray for our teachers this morning, Lord, that you give them the words that they need to say. Lead them and guide them. Have them to do the things that they need to do for you, Father. Father, we just pray for Brother Johnny and our 11 o'clock message, Lord, that you'd send us a message, Lord, that would fill our hearts and our souls with overflowing, Lord. Father, all these prayer requests we've heard here this morning, Lord, we want to hand them over to you, that you would hand them in your own will and way. Father, like we've said before, it's on your timetable and not ours. Father, the ones that's lost loved ones this week, Father, we just pray that you comfort them down the way that I know how. Now, Father, go with us throughout the remainder of the service. Watch over us and take care of us. Lead us, guide us, and direct us. Lord, and forgive us when we fail you. For all these things, we ask in the blessing of the holy name. Amen. Okay. Anyone need a Sunday school book this morning before we get started? Okay. <clears throat> Today's lesson is on page 117. <clears throat> it's hard to believe we're almost at the end of another quarter. <clears throat> Can't believe how fast times are going, folks. It's passing by in a hurry. 
title of today's lesson is Jesus, the only way to God. Sure is. They've tried everything in the world to find another way to get there, but haven't come up with it, have they? The point of today's lesson is because Jesus is the Son of God, He is the only one who could bring us to God. The passage comes out of 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. <clears throat> Question one there. When have you wished you had taken another road? Or excuse me, when have you wished you had another road to take? <laughs> Get down here in the Bible meets life. <clears throat> Says we can all be narrow minded about something. It's funny to hear somebody insist. That staying on Highway two, uh, 231 will get you there faster when you're not convinced that taking several side roads actually saves time. A person can be so focused, so narrow-minded, that they can't see the advantages of another route. Christians are often accused of being narrow-minded. The accusation is that Christians are not... Uh, tolerant to other people's beliefs. Christians are fairly straightforward about their belief that Jesus Christ is the only way to God. But there is no such thing as not being narrow-minded. Every faith in existence is narrow-minded in that it excludes beliefs that are not in sync with its own teachings. Atheists are narrow-minded toward those who believe in God. Animists are narrow-minded toward those who only believe in one God. Pantheists are narrow-minded toward those who don't believe in impersonal life force. Everyone is narrow-minded. The question is not whether or not we are narrow-minded, but whether or not our narrow belief represents the truth. The Apostle John points us to the right narrow-mindedness. <clears throat> Gets us over to our first set of scripture, John 5, verses 1 through 5. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begeth loveth him also that is begotten of him. <clears throat> By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Everyone has a way that they think reality is to be structured and understood. Atheists believe that the natural universe, operating by natural laws, is all that exists. Animists believe that humans in the natural world interact in a symbolic relationship, a mutually beneficial relationship with the gods and spirits in the spiritual world. Pantheists believe that all of, the, of reality is made up of different expressions of the same substance and that everything in every part of the, uh, 
of rea reality is a part of the universal life force. Thank the force in the movie Star Wars. <clears throat> Non-Christian theists believe in a single God, but different from the God revealed in the Bible. Having this knowledge is important because every belief about the structure of reality comes with its own belief about salvation. Of course, many non-Christian faiths don't refer to their belief about salvation using the word salvation. Rather, they express it as the ultimate being one can achieve in life. While it is important to understand how other beliefs systems express their narrow-minded belief about the ultimate goal one can achieve in life. As Christians, we need to begin with understanding our own beliefs. Only then do we have something by which to compare to uh, the other beliefs. The Bible is very clear about the na uh, nature of salvation as seen in 1 John 5, 1 through 5. Christian salvation is more than merely receiving Christ into one's life. While that is the beginning point of salvation, it is not the complete picture. Christian salvation is not an event. It is a process. Justification. The beginning point of, of the salvation process is called justification. And John spoke of this in verse 1. Being born of God, or saved, comes by believing that Jesus is the Christ. In verse five, he referred to a, to a excuse me, he referred to a Christian as he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. The biblical concept of believing is not mere intellectual assent to the ideal. It is experience of entering, entering into an actual rela personal relationship with an objectively real personal God. It is entry into this personal relationship that begins the salvation process. Sanctification. Salvation does not end with justification. Think about a marriage relationship. Entry into marriage may begin with a marriage ceremony, but then the couple lives the relationship with one another for the rest of their lives. Comparing that to Christian salvation, we enter into a relationship with Christ by inviting him into our lives. But then we are to live in that relationship. The part of the salvation process that exists beyond the entry point is called sanctification. It is characterized by continual spiritual growth in the relationship with God. Our sanctification or our growing in the, salva in the salvation Jesus provided is experienced as we love God and keep his commandments. Our obedience demonstrates our love for God. In verse 4, John spoke of overcoming the world. This is an expression that indicates God is actually working in the life of an individual to accomplish his purposes in the world. Salvation is not merely a matter of saying a prayer and being baptized. It is a life that has been radically transformed into, a, uh, excuse me, transformed by entry into and living out a personal relationship with God himself. Question two here. Why do you think people believe there are many gods? Excuse me. I can't see this morning. Why do you think many, many people believe there are many ways to God? Try to add works in and everything else because of simplicity. I 
out. They said that the Bible said they stumble over the same place down and I blame the elder. Oh, yeah. Try to. Anyone have a comment on, on that section? <clears throat> All right, we'll move on over to verses 6 through 10 here. <clears throat> Anyone else have a comment? Right, we'll move over to the scripture here, six, verse 6. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three... <coughs> Three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his son he that believeth on the son of, excuse me he that believeth on the son of God hath the witness in himself he that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son when searching for the truth we must consider what evidence exists to back up our conclusions. When it comes to studying the physical world, there will be some way to explore it scientifically, but when it comes to spiritual truth, there is no such thing as empirical proof. But there is evidence that can be brought to the table. So what about Jesus? What do different beliefs say about him? Naturalists who don't believe in God generally acknowledge the existence in history of the man called Jesus, but they believe he is merely a human being. Animists generally consider Jesus to be one of the ancestor spirits. Pantheists typically believe Jesus was a man who, during his life on earth, achieved the highest level of enlightenment that humans can possibly achieve. Non-Christian theists consider Jesus to have been a prophet or some highly enlightened person sent to earth by God to accomplish a particular task. Kind of hard to fathom there that they believe God was 
a prophet sent by God to earth, but yet they can't realize <coughs> the full truth of it. That's, that's about what the Jews believe, Gary. They, they think Jesus was a good man. They think he was a prophet, but they don't think he was a Messiah. And that's where I think a lot of this comes in from. None of the four belief systems mentioned have a way to prove what they believe about Jesus. Many contend that since the Christian belief that Jesus is God in the flesh is ultimately based on faith, there is no evidence to back up to back that up. However, that is not true. While there is no such thing as scientific confirmation, legitimate proof still exists. The evidence for this is found both in the historical record and in the personal experiences of people coming to know Jesus as a personal, in a personal relationship. John laid this out in verses six through 10. John used the phrase, water and blood. This is a reference to the entirety of Christ's public ministry that began with his baptism, water, and ended with his crucifixion, the blood. John went on to emphasize Christ's death by saying, not by water only, but by water and blood. He did this not only to explain the spiritual significance of Christ's death, but also to reemphasize the historical reality of what Christ did when he came to earth. John's writing is eyewitness testimony that Jesus was not only the actual human being that lived on earth, but that he fulfilled the requirement of man's redemption by actual acts in history. But the fact that Jesus was a real person acting in history is not the sole evidence that he is the only way to heaven. We also have to work, have the work of the Holy Spirit that beareth witness because the Spirit is truth. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit gives testimony in believers' hearts that this is true. In verses seven and eight, John explained that the historical and and the spiritual evidence clearly demonstrates the truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He went on to affirm in verses 9 and 10 that those who believe in Christ have the proof of Christ's reality within themselves. Ultimately, believing in Christ is a decision that is made by faith, meaning there is no way to prove it scientifically. Actually, nothing about God exists. Existence can be proven scientifically because science can only deal with things that relate to the material world. But our faith is not blind faith. And it is not faith without evidence. Since God does exist and has revealed himself to humanity, his existence represents actual reality. When we read and understand the historical record of his revelation and we meet God in a personal, in a personal relationship, we have the strongest evidence that what the Bible says about Christ, he is the only, God, he is the only way to God is true. The evidence is in a life transformed by the work of Christ. How did you become convinced that Jesus is the Son of God? People shared it with us, Johnny. Our Bible tells us that. Uh, it's beyond me why 
like we've said here many a time, why people cannot see that there is a God. Exactly. I mean. Nature, just looking at nature, said, why would nature be teaching there is a God? So, seeing, just like the uh, belief in James, green and different colors, we all we call them as God's color, but it was so beautiful and happened so quick and now it's gone. But that's teaching you, they tell us something. It doesn't just happen. Exactly. God both spoke it into existence and then it happens. Get out on the parkway or some of these mountain roads, you get a chance to where you can see for miles. The glory of his creation, folks. Amen. Amen. I mean, that's all, that's all you can say. It's his creation, not ours. We did nothing. There's no way we could create anything like this anyhow. I'm like Johnny, I was going to use the tree, the tree leaves this time. Probably the prettiest color we've had in several years. Right. We were coming up the road this morning and Nan said, well, they're gone. Well, 99% of them are gone. 85% yeah. <clears throat> of them was my yard. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Another thing I look at it's God's creation. I don't know how many of you get the opportunity to see it in the afternoons or evenings. It's sunset. Sunsets. I've said it before and I'll say it here again this morning in front of you. God put me where I'm at, I think, just to see the sunsets he creates. Because we've basically got one every day. A beautiful sight. Some of them I take pictures of and I send you folks. It's just, uh, it's an amazement to me how God can create a sunset with the colors and sure. uh, the awe of it. I mean, it's just an amazement. He won't have anything on this section before we move ahead. Michael, we've been told over the years that's the living word. And like you said, you've never found nothing wrong in it, never found no discrepancies in it, and you won't find no discrepancies in it. Absolutely does, Colin. <clears throat> we've we've just let human nature take over part of our life. I mean, I, folks, I, I'll say this: 
when I'm up here teaching, God gives me something to say, I'm going to say it. Whether it's right or wrong, I'm going to say it. And I hope it doesn't offend anyone. But, like I said, we've let the old human side of us take over a lot of things that we shouldn't be letting take place. I mean, I'll speak for myself. Do I sit down and read and study the Bible like I should? No. I do read some. I do study some. Do I do as much as I need to? No. And I'll pay for that one of these days, folks. I'll pay for it. That's on my conscience. <clears throat> All right, let's move on into our next set of scripture here. <clears throat> this may get into some words here I can't pronounce. If it does, y'all just bear with me. So, uh, <clears throat> John uh, ver uh, chapter 5, verses 11 and thir through 13. And this is the record that God hath given us, hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son of he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Many people criticize Christians for proclaiming that eternal life is found only in a pers personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Where else are you going to get eternal life from, folks? Where else where, where is it coming from? As if that exclusivism... <clears throat> Were a negative thing, reality can only be structured one way. And everyone has a belief about how that structure exists. Every belief system in existence excludes those who don't embrace its view of reality. Throughout this session, I've pointed to four categories of false beliefs or worldviews. Every, every religion, cult, or philosophy in existence is somehow expressed in these four, in those four. And these all have exclu exclusive beliefs. Naturalists are exclusive as they exclude everyone who believes in a su supernatural existence. Animists are exclusive in that they exclude everyone who believes there is no spiritual reality and everyone who believes in only one God. Pantheists are exclusive in that they exclude everyone who does not believe reality is made up of an impersonal, immaterial life force. Non-Christian theists are exclusive as they exclude everyone who does not believe in their God. In final analysis, all of them fall apart because they are unable to back up their beliefs using their own theological requirements. Because Jesus is, is excuse me, because Jesus truly is God, incarnate and objectively died on the cross and rose again from the dead. He is the only one who has proven to provide eternal life that is confirmed as we enter into a relationship with him. While many other belief systems shy away from being labeled exclusive, Christianity stands squarely in reality and embraces the obvious. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Later, the Apostle Peter affirmed this. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none 
other name uh, under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Question four here. How can we teach that Jesus is the only way to, to, to salvation without all alienating those who need to hear that truth? Harry, I think one number one, not doing it in maybe our words, but doing it in God's words. No, if, if, if they're alienated by God's words, then they're not going to believe anyhow. But I think if we'll just take the Bible and explain what the Bible says to them and let them accept them or reject it, then they, they don't have a right to be aggravated to us because we're showing them what God works. <clears throat> While beliefs from all the various worldwide systems exist, existed in New Testament times, there was a particular false belief Not is that John was addressing. Gnosticism taught that there were various levels of gods in the cosmos and that gaining their pleasure and guidance required special knowledge or yeah, special knowledge that only the Gnostic or the Gnostics knew or held. They taught that salvation was to be found only in the secret knowledge that the Gnostic teachers, John uh, disputed the Gnostics, claimed by asserting that salvation is not found in God, a Gnostic teaching, but only in Christ, or Jesus Christ. He wrote, God hath given us, given, excuse me, God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. John doubled down in verse 12 by positively affirming, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Salvation is a relation, uh, relational and has nothing to do with special knowledge gained by listening to Gnostic teachers. John said, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. John recognized that there were spiritual wolves walking among, among the believers who were trying to get them to believe a false gospel. It's happening every day, isn't it? Yes. Probably worse now than it was then. Yes. He wanted the Christians to be clear that the ex exclusive truth of the gospel was not found in false Gnostic teaching, but only by belief in the name of the Son of God. Question five. How can we know that we have eternal life? Have a true relationship with God Himself. I know in whom I believe. You want to have anything on this section? <clears throat> uh, we move it over here to live it out. Is how will you live out the truths of this study? Trust. Trust God for the miracle of a, of a changed life. If you want to know how to become a follower of Christ, talk to a group leader, or you can also read the inside front cover of this book. Identify. Identify exclusive beliefs. Do a study on the beliefs of naturalism, anonism, atheism, and non-Christian theism. As you study, make a chart that identifies specifically at what, at what points their beliefs are exclusive. Defend. 
If you know someone who complains about the exclusive nature of Christianity, discover what faith system they believe. Engage the person in a, in a discussion about the exclusivity of his or her beliefs, and then, then compare that with the exclusive claims of Christianity. Anyone have a comment on today's lesson? All right, if not, if you come to your feet, we're going to be dismissed. Brother Mason, you care to dismiss us this morning?